Kim Trent. Good morning. Hope everyone is enjoying this nice cloudy weather that we're having here in Mackinac. It's pretty standard, but we're happy to be together once again after a brief pause. And um, I think we're going to have a really amazing conversation with some great thinkers um, this morning. You know, 53 years ago, the Kerner Commission issued a federal report examining the causes of the civil unrest that took place in many American cities um, in the late 1960s, with a particular focus on the 1967 rebellion in Detroit. This report should have been a launching pad for a new era in American race relations. Sadly, it wasn't. I thought I would start this conversation with a pointedly accurate quote from that report. What white Americans have never fully understood but what the Negro can never forget is that white society is deeply implicated in the ghetto. White institutions created it, white institutions maintain it, and white society condones it. I think it's important that we define what constitutes white institutions. When the Kerner Commission indicted white institutions, they weren't talking about country clubs and NASCAR. The white institutions that they that created <laughs> and maintain the racial wealth gap are federal, state, and local government, the banking industry, and educational institutions, to name but a few. The racial wealth gap is a byproduct of racism, systemic, structural racism. Racism that has been animated by policies and laws and maintained by institutions. Government's culpability in creating and sustaining the racial wealth gap is undeniable. For example, federal housing policies, reinforced by local laws, gave white Americans access to home ownership while locking black Americans into neighborhoods and communities that experienced disinvestment that often turned them into repositories of blight and desperation. Local zoning laws have prevented economic diversity um, in um, communities that have strong school systems and desirable amenities. And while it is encouraging that the state's 2022 school aid budget will invest $723 million to close Michigan's K-12 foundation funding gap, and that is an applause line, um, <laughs> some lawmakers uh, have been slow to uh, adopt structural changes that would address the funding disparities that hinder student success in many communities of color at a time when education is increasingly linked to economic mobility. As you can imagine, the Kerner Commission's findings were controversial in 1968. Even today, many Americans summarily reject the essential truth of them. However, the COVID-19 crisis has laid bare the racial wealth and employment disparities forcing long overdue conversations about the need for governmental intervention to address them. In this session, we will talk about how race and poverty intersect, how the race, racial wealth gap manifests, and most importantly, reparative strategies to close it. I serve as the key staffer to the Michigan Poverty Task Force, which was convened in 2019 to make recommendations to the governor to coordinate and activate efforts within state government to lift Michigan families out of poverty and help them to find a path to opportunity. The task force is made up of 14 State Department directors who are charged with working with key stakeholders in government, education, the nonprofit sector, philanthropy, and Michiganders who are exper experiencing economic instability to help develop strategies to help um, over, struggling Michiganders overcome barriers to upward mobility. The Poverty Task Force has been intentional about ensuring that the state's anti-poverty strategies center racial equity as a policy goal. In this way, the task force is aligned with meaningful action that Governor Whitmer has taken to elevate equity as a core principle of the work of state government. From mandating implicit bias training for every state employee and every state contractor, 
to compelling every state department to an, appoint an equity and inclusion officer, to requiring implicit bias training for Michigan's licensed healthcare professionals, Governor Whitmer has demonstrated a willingness to push state government to grapple with uncomfortable truths about the importance of policy solutions to address racial inequities. I also serve as Leo's Equity and Inclusion Officer, and in that role, I have worked to help our employees understand that we cannot divorce historical context from the work that we do every day. Context matters. All three of our panelists today have written about the critical role that the legacy of racist housing policy has played in the persistence of the racial wealth gap. As the Michigan State Housing Development Authority develops its first statewide housing plan, MISHTA, and I see Gary is in the house, MISHTA has embedded into its work the goal of equitable housing policy that acknowledges how the history um, that we are talking about today has contributed to modern housing challenges for people of color. It is not enough for institutions that help to create the racial wealth gap to acknowledge that the gap exists. We must create bold, reparative strategies to address the problem. I am excited to be joined today by three of the most innovative thinkers about these issues, and I am hopeful that the leaders in this room will be inspired to action by their ideas. Um, and I would like for you to help me welcome to the stage our panelists. Joining Kim Trent on stage, please welcome Chief Executive Officer of Detroit Future City, Anika Goss. Henry Cohen Professor of Economics and Urban Policy and Founding Director of Institute on Race and Political Economy for the New School Milano, Derek Hamilton. Senior Fellow for the Brookings Metropolitan Policy Program, Andre Perry. So and as we um, have this conversation, as questions come up that you have, um, please feel free to, there are cards on your table, please feel free to fill out the cards and we will be collecting them and um, at the end of our conversation, we want to engage with you. So I want to just start by asking all our panelists, um, what do you think uh, moving from poverty to prosperity looks like in the work that you do every day? And I think I'm going to start with Anika. Thanks, Kim. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when I think about moving from poverty to prosperity, one of the things that comes to mind immediately is that the, the idea that 54% of African, middle class African Americans live outside of Detroit means that right now Detroit is not a place that's cultivating prosperity. And if you are going to grow your family, grow your own wealth, generate opportunities for you, your family, as an individual, then it means you're moving outside of the city and moving across the region. And this is not unique to Detroit. We're seeing middle class African Americans uh, move outside of urban centers across the country. I think what's problematic is that Detroit is still 78% African American. And so then what ends up happening is that we end up concentrating areas in Detroit of such deep poverty that you can't move from poverty to prosperity. So that the only jobs are low, that are growing in Detroit become low wage jobs for Detroiters. So that our education attainment then becomes limited to only finishing high school so that you can work at this low wage job and you just can't achieve prosperity in that way. That, that is really powerful. Um, I think I'll ask Derek that question too. So from poverty to prosperity, um, I guess uh, we would know it when somebody's race, gender, or ethnicity no longer has transactional value. When you can go into the marketplace and you're not diminished because you're black. When you can go into the marketplace, you're not diminished because you're a woman. When I think about prosperity, from poverty to prosperity, the big word that comes to mind is power. The ability to make decisions as it relates to your life. Authentic freedom, not the freedom that's captured by simply 
laissez-faire markets where if you just liberate markets, people will have freedom. What's absent from that narrative is power. If you enter a transaction and you don't have resources or you don't have any power, then you are subject to exploitation, extrapolation, or you're at the whim of poverty. So whether you're a socialist, capitalist, you know, those are largely textbook concepts, but in practice, people need to enter transactions with power. And this is why I support anti-racist economic rights. We need to get beyond notions of not be limited to our notions of human rights and political and civil rights, but recognize that they are enabling goods and services that empower people so that they have authentic agency in their lives, like the right to health care, like the right to a basic job, like some wealth, some foundation, a capital foundation. I can keep going, but from poverty to prosperity, we would move to a society that enables people to have power and to be able to make decisions as it relates to their lives. Andre? Yes, from power to prosperity. The, the, the first thing uh, I, I think about is that we have to acknowledge that poverty is a man-made disaster mm -hmm. and that racism is a primary tool of that disaster. Mm -hmm. And if we're ever going to get prosperity, it's going to require that we restore the value that's been extracted by racism. And so, and, and also, it means that we must prevent poverty from happening. I'll, 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 I'll provide a, a, just a small plug. Derek Hamilton and I are working on a project um, where we are trying to create the framework for an equity scoring mechanism. So that just as we score policies' impacts on budgets, we should score policies' impact on, 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 on various groups, particularly those who have been disenfranchised throughout history. And so for me, it means preventing it from happening in the first place and repairing the damage that's been done over this, the course of history. And that takes intention, will, and power, but it, it also takes um, a moral sort of ethic in how we address these problems moving forward. And, and, and we'll get into this a little bit later, um, but uh, we talk all the time, but there's many ways to inspire economic growth. Will we do it in an ethical way, a moral way, one that is inclusive, uh, in inclusive rather than I exclusive? Wow, you set me up beautifully for the next question, which is for Derek, actually, um, about exclusivity, because we know that a lot of conversations about economic growth have that model. Can you talk about how we can kind of shift the narrative to a conversation about shared prosperity? I like it. All right, so, you know, our, our fundamental measure of how well the economy is doing is usually GDP per capita, right? And what's absent in that? Any notion of equity? Um, any notion of morality. So, um, of course, we need a growing economy with a growing population to be able to, to fuel uh, additional needs. But if we are myopic in the ways in which we identify and measure our economic well-being, as Andre was describing, then that's problematic. The focus is wrong. We need to recognize that we define the economy. The economy is not some simple positivist endeavor that just is. Any market you define, if you look at, you know, the classic textbook example in economics is a farmer's market. You have to get a permit to operate in a farmer's market. Markets are political constructions. We can define the economy we want, and what we need to do is emphasize human capabilities. We should put that front and center. Our most treasured resource is our people. Capital is important. Capital facilitates people, not people facilitating capital. So capital is useful and should be thought about when we consider our economy, but the end goal should be how well we facilitate our people to be their best selves. That's how we define a moral economy. And again, as I led, when one's race, gender, or some cursory characteristic has any transactional value, that's immoral. That's a problem economy, and we can do better. Andre, can you, um, maybe building upon what Derek was just saying, can you talk a little bit about the role of the private sector in, um, you know, when we talk about entrepreneurship and home ownership and how, um, you know, they have been uh, factors in wealth generation and, um, uh, you yeah. know, the wealth gap? You know, a lot of my, um, uh, a lot of people know me for my work on housing and business, and 
Um, my colleagues Jonathan Rothwell and David Harshberger and I um, uh, issued a report a few years back on housing prices in black majority neighborhoods where the share of the black population is 50% or higher. And we compared those to homes in areas where the, the, population, the share of the black population is less than 1%. And what we found um, may not surprise people that homes in black neighborhoods are priced lower, but a lot of people will say that's because of education, that's because of crime. But those are things you can control for in a study, and that's what we did. And so when we control for education, crime, walkability, all those fancy Zillow metrics, what we found is that homes in black neighborhoods are underpriced by 23%, about 48,000 per home. Cumulatively, that's about 156 billion in lost equity. Put that in perspective, 156 billion would have financed more than 4.4 million black-owned businesses based upon the average amount black people use to start their firms. Would have paid for more than 8 million four-year degrees based upon the average amount of a four-year public education. Um, uh, replaced the pipes in Flint, Michigan 3,000 times over. Covered nearly all of Hurricane Katrina damages. Doubled the annual economic burden of the opioid crisis. When things go wrong in black communities, we blame black people. That's why I always say there's nothing wrong with black people that ending racism can't solve. Because when we have got to address policy and stop blaming people, another study, what we, um, and, and by the way, I just want to, um, um, in Detroit, that housing devaluation is about 37%, about 28,000. In Grand Rapids, about 24%, 29,000. So we are extracting wealth every day in Michigan and blaming black folk at the same time. In, in, in another study, and I'll be, I'll try to be very quickly, quick with this, we scraped all the Yelp data to get a sense of quality of businesses. Um, and what we found will not surprise those in this room who are intimately tied to black business, that black, brown, and Asian businesses actually score higher on Yelp, but they get less revenue as the businesses are situated in black places. My housing research um, shows that, that the price point of homes is almost as if when people see black communities, they see twice as much crime than there actually is. They see worse education than there actually is. In business, that perception is costing um, highly rated businesses upwards of $4 billion nationally. There's a saying in the hood that you used to hear all the time, our ice is just as cold. Our ice is just as cold. What the elders knew that if you don't frequent businesses in black communities, you distort the market in a way where you're forcing highly competitive um, uh, or quality businesses are competing with low, uh, lowly quality, quality businesses, and you're just getting less revenue in those places. So I say all that to say that we have got to invest in the underappreciated assets that will show the more growth than investing in the same old tired plans that we have been doing for the last forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, Anika, just building on that, because um, it's true that our ice is just as cold in Detroit, but as you said in the beginning, 54% of our black middle class lives outside of the city. Um, and your, your state of economic equity report brilliantly laid out you know, what that really means in practical terms. Can you just talk a little bit about um, you know, what that means in the Detroit context, protecting those middle class communities? You know, we at Detroit Future City, we made a deliberate decision to not focus on poverty. And that's, that's tough, right? I'm a social worker by training. I've only focused on poverty. Um, and I'm a third generation social worker. So, <laughs> uh, but what was really, what became really evident is if we only focus on poverty and not what happens when people get that job, right? When they get that one job and how they are able to sustain their family, where they, if, if, if they're not secure about where they're going to live, where they're going to send their children to school, if there are no opportunities beyond that, then focusing on poverty will just keep them in just less poverty. And that can't be the Detroit that we want to build, right? That's not the future of Detroit. The future of Detroit has to be a place where you can grow the middle class that's already there. 
And one of the things that I find, I find many things disturbing, but one of the most, thing, most important things I think that's disturbing about that is from an urban planning perspective, we're beginning to see these trends year over year. Mm -hmm. So we're beginning to see the areas that we've made it targeted investments in, and not just recently, but we're seeing it recently, um, where we've made targeted investments downtown, midtown, Indian Village neighborhood. Um, these are the only neighborhoods, it's only about 11 neighborhoods that are considered middle class in Detroit. And of those 11, only about six of them grew in the last census. And those six only grew because there were upper income white households that moved into those neighborhoods. Now, we're not talking about a lot of people. The white people are not coming, right? We try to <laughs> explain that. There are no buses. No one is coming in like that. <laughs> However, the trend is what's so disturbing because these are also the areas of the city that are the most stable. And what we have to really think about is that the rest of the 139 square mile or 136 square miles of the city has to be places where we identify places of opportunity for middle class families, places where we can stabilize housing, places where small businesses in the commercial corridors can grow without having to be white-owned businesses, without, have to, without having to have that gentrifying factor. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that that in and of itself has to be the new way of thinking about what middle class can mean for Detroit. To me, this is as urgent as poverty. Mm -hmm. We can't lose Detroit to become a place that's so isolated that you can only be in three or four neighborhoods and feel like you're getting your value. Mm. Wow, that's really, that's really powerful. And um, I just want to also point out that your report is available and every, everyone has a copy of the report at the seat and at, at your seats. And um, you know, I think one of the really powerful um, ways that you really illustrate what the future should look like is these three lenses that you introduced in the report, a, a just lens um, that you talk about how uh, everyone does better in gaps are closing, um, an equitable lens where everyone does better but gaps still remain. And then, you know, I think what we're hoping for is a reparative lens right. um, where everyone is improving but we um, are addressing and accounting for those historical disparities. You know, I just want to ask everyone on the panel, how do we get there? How do we get to that place where we're feeling like we're doing that reparative work, where we, people are invested in that kind of work. And I think I'll start with Andre. Well, you know, there, there's three general uh, ways. You invest in people, um, because if you invest in place over people, you essentially um, will raise values and, and folks will be pushed out. But so you, it, uh, you have to provide direct capital to people, particularly those who are, are, are who understand the nexus between economic and community development. I'm looking at people like Chase Cantrell, who's sitting in the, in the middle. Raise your hand, Chase, because Chase. you're doing incredible work. Or, or, yeah, you can give that man a hand. <laughs> and, Orlan and Orlando Bailey and other, Orlando, give that man a hand, too. <laughs> So you, you have to provide direct capital to people in communities. You know, I've, you know, I've been a part of several regional economic development um, co um, uh, conversation. And what that means is move the money away from black folk. Mm -hmm. And when and white folk move to the, um, to the downtown areas, then it becomes, oh, let's, let's start talking about building up the inner city core. Mm -hmm. You know, we have got to find ways to provide direct capital to the, the builders in community. And so invest in, invest in people, but you do need to invest in place. Because of devaluation, you have a lot, of, a, just not a lot of resources um, in the community. So you do need to invest in, in place um, to beautify, to, to animate the assets that are there. And, and, and finally, in, in general, we have, must divest in racism. There are many different practices on the daily that, that prevent growth from happening. I mean, 
and nothing grows without investment. One of my favorite quotes from um, Vietnamese uh, philosopher Thich Nhat Hanh, who said, if you see a head of lettuce and it's not growing, you don't blame the lettuce. You look to see if the soil is rich, if it's getting sunlight, if it's getting rain. You never blame the lettuce. But when we're talking about economic development, when we're talking about education, we, we are constantly blaming the lettuce. Mm. Fix the teachers. Um, have the kids um, get some training program. And we never look at the underlying policy conditions that prohibit growth. So for me, that's where you begin. You, you have to invest in the people invest in place, divest, but understand it's our policies that are causing this. And by the way, one, this one final thing, we have to be self-effacing about this. Mm. The white institutions also included the economic development organizations, the chambers of commerce, the captains of industry that throttled growth in black neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. This did not happen by accident. And so for us, we have got to re realize the power that we have to create change or to maintain status quo. Derek? So I'm, I want to, I guess, try to say some uncomfortable, what I believe to be truths, um, to not only be provocative, but also to really move us to the point where we want to address systematic racism. Racism can grow an economy. America benefited from slavery if, if growth is the measure. So, so the notion that equity is, this, is the superior growth model, that's context specific. It could be the case that investing in underutilized resources can lead to greater growth. We know that um, when a government wants to grow an economy, we often engage in stimulus. And you could have one approach where you stimulate those at the low end of the economy. And you could generate a higher consumption multiplier effect because they have to consume by almost by definition. I mean, other, uh, another structure you could have where you can grow an economy if workers have no bargaining power and they're more vulnerable to extrapolation and exploit exploitation, that's immoral. And that's perhaps, and that's hopefully not the economy we want and deserve. But we need to grapple with the, with the point that racism benefits people if we focus solely on economic growth and not care about a moral economy. So um, if we get rid of racism, white people would have to give up white privilege. Now, um, in a, when we have growing despair and growing anxiety, and people start to fear, and those are legitimate fears, we become reticent to give up some of that privilege. The privilege of, of not being the first fired or the last hired when, when there's an economic swing in the business cycle. Um, but a shared, prosperous economy is another type of economy when we value different things. Just like pe people care about their self-interested accumulation with no bounds, and that promotes tribalism, we also care about our fellow man. We, we have not had the opportunity to really present ourselves, man and woman, I apologize. We, we, we have not had the opportunity to present those type of values. An economy grounded in sustained, shared prosperity, where again, those things I mentioned earlier, those cursory characteristics, have no value in the marketplace. Um, and then let me, let me say another uncomfortable truth, and I promise I'm not going to talk too long. Um, I'm talking to a chamber of commerce. Um, there is the tension between profit and workers. That is, that is a tension that will exist, because if profit is the sole goal, one way to generate profit is uh, to, to extract as much from workers and pay them the least amount, or to offer consumers the highest prices possible without, you know, with, 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 with something they'll purchase um, without offering them as much input from your firm in so doing. Those are ways in which we can generate profit. So that creates a tension. Of course, if you have workers that are productive investing in workers, that that can lead to profit. But we shouldn't ignore that other part of the, that other part of the equation. So corporations can go beyond profit because a corporation is based on a public charter. So we can define what corporations value as a society. We, we can define that they value things beyond profit, that they value things like workers and people. But that becomes a political choice. There's nothing natural about that unless we make that political choice. 
And I suspect in the room, you know, another point is that corporations are made up of people, and some people have those values that I'm describing. So it's not, it, it, you know, I would be reticent to just say corporations are just some functioning thing void of people. They are made up of people. So let me get to the bottom line. Uh, if we want to have solutions, we need to honestly grapple with reparations. If we were to look at contemporary context devoid of history that took place, then you know, we will never get beyond our race problem until we address reparations. And reparations isn't just for black people. There's a truth in reconciliation where we articulate with, 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 with truth how we got here, and then we won't define poverty in those anti-black terms as deficient people. We'll know that poverty exists because people lack resources. So that, that narrative change is good for everyone. And then, of course, it's the most direct and parsimonious way to address the racial wealth gap. But reparations is not enough, because capital does what it does base. It iterates, it consolidates, it benefits some, and often excludes others, which is why we need a government that promotes anti-racist economic rights, that ensures that people have a birthright to capital. I talk about baby bonds, for instance. Um, it ensures that people have quality housing, quality health care. If you're, if, when you're most vulnerable when you're sick, you should not be worried about finance at that point. The stigma of finance, as, long, as, as well as the burden of the cost of finance, when we're most vulnerable, that should not exist. Similarly, if you're going to, going to higher education, we should have debt-free public education. If we value education, then we should provide it without debt for all our people. Simple. We can afford this. Poverty is a political choice, and I can say a lot more, but I know I'm talking on too much. <laughs> Before I ask Anika to answer that question, I just want to remind you that we do have cars on the table, um, and we would love to hear from you and hear your questions. And we have folks who will, um, if you see back in the, in the back of the room, we have uh, people who will collect your cars if you have them. Anika? I, so I'm going to keep it quick, because I, I, I really want to get to the questions, because there's been so much information today. But the way we're really thinking about, when we think about reparative policy and what that can mean for us, the, the, one of the most um, triggering uh, data points to me was the fact that um, the value of a loan in Detroit is half that of the value of the loan if, you are, if you're a small business. Uh, outside of Detroit, if you're in, in, in the metro area. And that, that one point struck me, because I've spent 18 years in uh, working for community development financial institutions, un understanding underwriting, understanding investment. And what I understand about that underwriting from financial institutions is that you're starting with a base value. Right? You're starting with the average value of the loan for that area. And if in Detroit, if African Americans in Detroit are already starting a half a step behind and have been a half a step behind for the past 50 years or more, how can we create equity for small business or for mortgages? If we, if we aren't starting at an even playing field. And so then what is required is a reparative policy that would allow for that equity to occur so that everyone can achieve the kind of uh, lending capital, access to capital that they need to prosper. And so I, I, I just really feel like, because I know when we say reparative, that often shuts people down and I, I really want to put it in really plain terms so people understand that this is real. This is not what's happening 400 years ago. This happened two years ago. Two years ago, the average loan, right, was, was half. So I think this is really important for us to, to consider. But I want to I know we only have a few more minutes. You know, what's what's uh, <laughs> okay. funny right. is, I, I, you know, white people actually believe in reparations. You know, because we've seen it throughout history. Clearly, um, Holocaust survivors, we, I mean, um, Native Americans are not satisfied with the rep reparations programs. 
but there was some acknowledgement. Um, Japanese in turn, 9-11 victims. White people only don't want reparations when it comes to black people. <laughs> like, they, I mean, for me, it's, it, 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 that's when it becomes uncomfortable. And so, um, call it what you want. Call it stimulus, call it, <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't know. But it, understand there was an injury, there are claims, and there's an unpaid invoice since uh, 1865. Mm -hmm. that's, that's been on the table. And so for me, this is not something that is radical. Mm -hmm. It's been done before. It's just not done for us. Well, it was interesting. They had a, um, a gubernatorial candidate in California who got a lot of attention for saying, well, maybe the slaveholders should have gotten oh. reparations instead of um, slaves because they lost their property. And he didn't understand that actually there were <laughs> slaveholders who <laughs> did get reparations. Yeah, that's, so, right. that's right. All right, but we're not going to talk about We're that. not going to talk about that. No, but it's just... <laughs> 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 well, we don't talk about that, but it's just interesting because, no, no, as, yeah. as Andre said, there is precedent for um, rep reparative practices Absolutely. to to um, you know, help us move forward in our economy. So, um, do we have cards that we can talk about? Oh, this is one. Okay. Um, so, there is so much work to be done in the long journey ahead. What are the first, most critical steps for us to take? <laughs> I, <no. laughs> yeah, and I know we got like a little bit of time and a lot of questions. I, you know, no, I, we I still get... have time. We've, oh, we, we're, we're good. Yeah, we're good. Uh, you know, I'll be quick and, and just say that we need a government that empowers its people. And the frame I like to use is recognizing that human rights is incomplete if we think only about political and civil rights and don't recognize the role of economic rights, the assurance. And this is not charity. This is not handout. This is empowering people so that they can more adequately realize their human capabilities. Because again, without resources and power, they're vulnerable to the whims of charity or exploitation. That's simple. And I'm a, um, I'm a big believer in starting with the basics, housing policy, um, um, work, um, pay. I mean, obviously, in, place, in places like Michigan, child care workers are, are, are paid horribly. I mean, horribly. And so, I mean, we, we have to look at the workforce. We have to look at labor markets. We have to look at housing. We look, have to look at um, those who are energy insecure. Um, as, as you know, too, um, as sadly you know too well, um, tax assessments robbed uh, thousands of homeowners of, of wealth. So there's some things that we can do on the housing front um, um, and, as, and in terms of pay that can um, restore value quickly. Okay. Um, we have a question about uh, disabilities. As we talk about race, gender, um, mm. et cetera, included in all people, children and adults with disabilities. Dismissed and devalued is their middle name. And the ecosystem around them is also devalued. Where do you see people with disabilities in the entire equity conversation? Yeah, we, um, so we have a report coming out that's gonna be focused just on people with disabilities in Detroit um, and the, the limitations. Uh, that are existing there, and we've been working really closely with the City of Detroit um, Accessibility uh, Division. Um, and what I think what was really disturbing um, for us is uh, when we were looking at this issue in particular is ac it's access, right? It's whether it's access to jobs, your access to be mobile around the city, and your access to get to a job, and your access to quality, affordable, sustainable home, home ownership, or even rental housing that's accessible. And uh, the lack of that actually is a part of that equity conversation. And so even though broadly, so we, we are completely including that as well. We've, we're actually tracking some data on that and actually incorporating that data into our data platform. So you'll begin to be able to see that in the next uh, few weeks. Um, okay. Yeah. That's great. Um, this is an interesting question. Can, can oh, I I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, and I'll try to be quick. Um, you know, I, we said things about a moral economy, but I think we also related to the question with regards to disability is we need a care economy. Mm -hmm. Right now, 
Well, in general, one thing that unifies us as human beings is that we're all going to need care at some point in our life. So we need an economy that invests in that care from cradle to grave that ensures that we all have quality care and access to care. Uh, you know, we undervalue the workers that provide that care. We genderize it. We genderize it in a way that limits the, um, the, the, the choice set of women to do things yeah. beyond care. Um, but also, when they engage in care, we undervalue them. Um, what else? The, the, the people who receive that care, they don't, they don't receive often the most quality care, in part because we undervalue it in the way we pay for it. So again, in this concept of investing in our greatest resource, our people, we need a care economy. What's more is that we have a public sector that can not only directly hire people regardless of disability status, regardless of race, gender, and put people to work in functioning roles that contribute to our economy, but that work can also facilitate better engagement of people regardless of, again, their, their race, gender, or disability status. And, you know, something that came to mind is that we must center um, people of varying ability levels in our uh, planning processes. If you are a city planner and you don't have architects and planners who, um, who happen to have a disability, then you're going to fail in providing the, uh, the physical environment that allows for people to use all five senses to get around. I'm, I'm blanking on the architect who happens to be blind name, mm -hmm. but he um, is creating um, structures that enable people varying ability or works with vary varying ability levels of, of, of people's strengths. And so we need in our planning processes to center people of varying abilities or, um, across the board. Yep, that's really true and powerful and something that we all should really think about. Um, so this question is about the idea of a shared community. Um, time and again, we're, we see mm -hmm. that American society doesn't, um, doesn't operate from a shared lens. How do, we, how do we move in that direction? Obviously, we're a nation that values rugged individualism. Uh, how do yeah. we get to um, this idea that we have um, shared community? Our current structure is on the ropes. This uh, neoliberal society that emphasizes a laissez-faire, lack of government, if we only just allow corporations to, um, without any regulation, um, create a dynacism that's supposed to trickle down to all of us. Well, you know, again, uncomfortable truth. For the last 50 years, we've had growth in that product. The gains of the productivity have not been widely dispersed. Mm -hmm. So our current structure is on the ropes from both sides of the spectrum. We had a near takeover of the Capitol in January. And then we have uh, large protests in the street, even in a pandemic, uh, clamoring that Black Lives Matter. And you know, I dare say, and that is because, again, we've had a society where, again, with growth, it has not been widely dispersed. So I guess uh, the, the concern is that uh, we don't want to have fascism. I hope we don't go to, that, to that, that type of stage where we divide people and we don't have that unified community ethic in America. Um, so, so that is, unfortunately, a possibility in this paradigm. But on the other hand, we have another paradigm, another social movement that is arguing that we don't care. We demand that we have a sustainable society. We care about climate change and what it's going to do. We don't care. Um, we, we demand that women are treated fairly in the workplace. We don't care. We demand that black lives matter. So if we go that route, in my view, if we go that right route to build a moral economy that focuses on our shared prosperity, um, then I think we could have a transformation from this current structure that values, that values me, 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 and individualistic identity so much in a way that can be positive and we can end up with a much better society. Yeah. You know, oh, go ahead. Oh. Well, yeah, go ahead. Go, go, go for it. Go for it. I, w I was just going to say that I, I feel like it also goes back to even if you are an individualist and you're only worried about your own gains, if you're if you're trying to exist in an area in a in a market that continues to fail, 
because the, the poverty is much greater than the prosperity in the community, then you're not going to get very far. Right? You're only going to get you're only going to get so far. And what kind of community do you really want to live in where the majority of your population is doing so poorly? Right? So I I, I have a lot of trouble understanding um, uh, that mindset. You know, I was going to uh, talk a, a little bit about individual and how it plays out in communities, in that we have um, land, um, land use zoning laws that were built to be exclusive, mm -hmm. to keep people out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and one of the things we have to change all across the country are these single-family zoning ordinances that were designed to keep black people out. Mm -hmm. In addition, we do need new ownership models um, um, in terms of, of housing and land. Because if you live in some areas of the country, this may not be true um, in Michigan, where there are thousands of properties um, priced below a point that a bank will, won't back with a mortgage, and um, we need new loan products, essentially get low-income renters into those homes, and we need in, in investments to develop these places. But if you live on the West Coast, in S San Francisco, and you're a teacher, a teacher, I mean, we won't even talk about <laughs> Uh, other working class, uh, uh, working class job, it is almost impossible to purchase a home without some new, without some radical change. So it, that doesn't just mean that we should do these things in San Francisco or in New York City. We need new ownership models that encourages inclusion in Michigan because it, we are built to segregate, we are built to exclude. And you know, the way we live, the way we work, I can always point to a policy that encourages it. And then when I come to um, events and programs like this, we talk about programs, giving kids programs, and maintaining the structures that we know will produce exclusion. I, can I say one more thing about that? that um... I think just to add to Andre's point, that it is so, um, I think what we're seeing right now with the, the, the heat environment, the climate change, all of the rain that we're getting in Southeast Michigan, um, what is also most visible are the neighborhoods where we have not updated infrastructure at all. And not even neighborhoods, communities, cities, areas, right? And where, where, how that ends up translating, we can just put it in a climate change uh, silo over here. But it, it is also a market devaluation, right? Because then these are also neighborhoods where the infrastructure is so poor that it floods every time it rains. Mm -hmm. And that the, these are areas that have longstanding vacancy and blight in the same neighborhoods for 30 years, 40 years in some cases. So how we think, or poor sidewalks, poor streets, poor lighting, th this, is all, this is all connected. And I really feel like when we think about a shared prosperity in the community, we have to also think about what the infrastructure uh, investment costs, mm -hmm. that's a part of that as well. It's not just the ec a, a siloed economic structure. Okay, so we have two more questions okay. so that um, <laughs> we'd love to get through. And um, one is about, we, I think that we've had some pretty compelling arguments about um, why reparations are something um, that we, we want to look at um, as a, a model. Um, and one of the questions, actually these, both of these questions kind of revolve around um, what kind of research exists that um, really explains what is the best way to implement. So, you know, some of the ideas that were mentioned today were baby bonds, um, you know, investing in, mm. in black entrepreneurship. Can you, what, I, what do you think are the best vehicles for reparations? You know, I think there are, are several, because there are several, several in, injuries that were caused by racism. So if you're talking about slavery, you're talk, essentially about cutting a check. When you're talking about housing discrimination, you're essentially talking about down payment assistance, tax credits, 
um, the like. If you're talking about education, you're talking about um, scholarships of some free college. And just to give you an indication of what some type of reparative practice would look like, the one bright spot we saw in housing was that millennial home ownership actually went up a tick um, during certain quarters of the pandemic. Why do you ask? Certainly the lack of spending, the ability to spend in certain areas um, enabled people to save money and they could use that discretionary income to purchase home. But do not discount the, what the power of freezing student loans mm -hmm. um, has mm -hmm. done for black Americans. That's right. That, that when you, when you, fr um, when you um, cancel student debt, you see an amel ameliorative, uh, 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 um, eliminating the, the, the wealth gap effect um, at every, almost every single level. So the more debt you cancel, the more we close the wealth gap. And the reason why I, I say that, remember, I mean, Derek actually was one of the first writers on this that I, I saw because there was this meme out there that a debt cancellation is regressive, that it only helps the rich. And actually that meme continued even during the pandemic where the people were actually saying, we're, we're, we're helping doctors <laughs> uh, with canceling student debt. That's all we're helping, as if doctors aren't providing uh, a, a service. But when, when we looked under the hood on that, man, canceling student debt really helped close the wealth gap, particularly among those with low wealth to negative wealth. That's right. And across different strata. So there are many different reparative programs that you can implement, but it really depends on the, the claim that an injury that, um, that you have. Yeah. You wanna go? No. Okay, uh, so, um, you know, I wanna be clear that those things that Andre described are, are useful, beneficial policies, but they're not reparations. Right. There, there is, if, if we're clear, reparations is very specific. It's very specific, which is it's defined as um, truth and reconciliation of the ways in which our country through government facilitated policy either extrapolated, exploited, or basically engaged in terrorist act through violence against the community and uh, limited their capacities to grow. And when, and when they did grow, we're always subject to political confiscation. And I can go through the history, and we all know the history, and find specific examples. Well, not that, all of us know the history. <laughs> yeah. so, so we can, you know, we, there is that history, and reparations would not only be the acknowledgement, but the redress of it. And that's, mm -hmm. that's soul cleansing. We, and, and if we're not at that political moment to do it today, mm -hmm. um, hopefully, I believe in the trajectory of justice, we'll get there. Um, and it's also feasible, the question of feasibility, We've seen our government with capacities to intervene in our economy with large sums of resources because we are a sovereign monetary entity. We can pay for things that lead to productive use. There's precedent, and I can go through that precedent, but I know our time is running short. <laughs> I just want to go and, and, and talk about the anti-racist economic policies, some that, that Andre described. Um, again, we, we, we need a government to ensure that everybody has access to inalienable goods and services so that they can be productive, like capital. That's the number one. And why do I say anti-racist? Because our past has shown us that even when we provided economic rights to our people, we did it in a way that was by design intentionally exclusive, that by design and implementation, we excluded some people. And I can give you the history, but I'm worried about time. <laughs> uh, but, but also, let me just say that the issue of can Solving debt closed the racial wealth gap. So I'm gonna push back a little bit and say that the most direct way to close the racial wealth gap is capital. Yeah. It is wealth that begets more wealth. It is having access to some capital. Most Americans that save passively. They have an asset that passively appreciates over your lifetime. And what's the critical ingredient? To own a business, to have a debt-free education, to purchase a home, capital. So capital is the most direct way to address the racial wealth gap. And then, but debt is important. Debt leads us to indentured servitude as it relates to debt. If people are subsistence populations paying onerous interest rates mm -hmm. so that all their, all their income is going towards um, a, a financial sector that's extracting from them, then they have limited capacities to get out of their hole. 
And the last thing is that Andre cited that uptick in millennial home ownership. We should recognize that right before the pandemic, millennials were generationally low in their home ownership rates, dating as far back as the greatest generation that came out of the Great Depression. And what's more amongst millennials, the racial wealth gap is as large as it's ever been since we've been recording uh, 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 home ownership inequality. So we need to be concerned, we, and, but we don't, that's not our destiny. Government can act in ways to change that destiny. So last question, and we do just have five minutes, so let's um, try to... Discipline ourselves. <laughs> I know this is, <laughs> we could all talk all day about all of these things, but um, I wanted to um, ask about uh, the business case for um, the kind of justice that we're seeking, the kind of um, uh, reparative um, um, policy that we're looking at. So um, how do you uh, make that business case for people who believe the status quo is in their best interest? And then as a related question, how do you drive investors in public corporations mm -hmm. to understand that in order to address the racial disparities um, that uh, we would, there would have to be kind of a shift to uh, lessen the priority of ROI? Mm -hmm. oh, I, I, you know, I knew that question was coming somehow, so I, I did <laughs> take down some notes on that. Um, nationally, black people represent about 14% of the population, but only 2.2% of the um, num uh, of, of employer firms in the country. If the, the percentage of employer firms match the black population, we would add 800,000 more businesses to the economy. Now, I'm going to talk about... Um, uh, um, Detroit, the Detroit Metro, not Detroit um, proper, but the Detroit Metro. Um, black businesses bring in, on average, about 1.7 million compared to 8.3 for non-black businesses. If the black um, revenue equal non-black businesses, we would bring in an additional $13 billion. If black businesses comprise the, the same percentage of black, uh, um, of, of, this black, the percentage of black businesses were comprised of the same number as black people, and we paid them what we pay non-black businesses, those employees. Um, we would see um, $3.3 trillion added to the local economy, 500,000 jobs created. In this regard, uh, again, you know, equity is stimulus. If, if, if we could, if people understood the, that, when you invest in black business, you invest in the, the entire community. And, and this goes back to what Derek said earlier, that this is about a moral uh, issue. Because, you know, we can go on. We have gone on, generation after generation after generation, um, uh, throttling black growth, while uh, um, white businesses succeeded in some cases. Now is the time to have a different growth model. And we can actually expand the proverbial pie, grow the proverbial pie in the process. And so if people understand what is possible by not cutting your nose to spite your face and, and giving people the power to change those, those structures that are um, prohibiting that growth, then we can see dramatic change um, or, um, in a relatively short period of time. So you all are a very polite audience. I can tell by some of the questions that, that have been asked. Uh, maybe we are not, in, we, maybe we are impolite guests up here. Be, and, and, but you know, I, I'm gonna push back a little bit on Andre. I'm gonna push back on the business case for um, investing in, in an equitable way. He may be right, but he also may be wrong. There's figures that he cite, um, perhaps they don't do enough dynamic scoring. Perhaps we could be overall at a higher growth rate if we, can, we continue to uh, allow for exploitation and extrapolation. Um, but maybe he's right. But here's my bottom line. The bottom line is that we're in the wrong paradigm if, if that's our sole measure of success. We should do it because it's the right thing to do, plain and simple. We should do it because it's the right thing to do, plain and simple. And then, you know, I'm, I'm gonna say a couple other things. Uh, Milton Friedman, the one thing I agree with him about the, the, the most one thing I agree with him about <laughs> is that the business of business is often business. 
So the reality is that the solution isn't going to come from the business community. You all can do your part. You all are, again, people with values and can do your part and make sure that our society's achieving the right values. Um, do demonstrations. So demonstrate what can happen when you simply give people resources. Demonstrate with the purpose of, of promoting a movement so the government can implement it and scale it up, because that's where the solution is going to come from. You can provide demonstrations. You can do your part. Um, but at the end of the day, it is government that's going to have to instill a moral economy to make this part. And government has been culpable. So government has acted in ways that have facilitated business communities to the detriment of its people in the past. Again, that's our, our hard, cold truth that we need to recognize. So again, that, that, yep. that sounds like a good truth yep, to sorry. end on. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yep, yep. Um, I, I want to thank everyone so much for joining us for this um, really provocative conversation. Um, please help, um, help me to um, usher out our guests. Uh, Andre Perry, Anika Goss, Derek Hamilton.